Good evening, folks, and welcome. It's glad to have you joining us. We are going to give it just another minute or two um, to let those who are connecting um, get settled in. Our panelists will be turning on their um, cameras and mics here, um, so we'll get started in just a moment as well. Thanks, all. All right, a solid minute or two in the virtual world seems like a year, but we'll go ahead and get started so we can maximize our time this evening. Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Walsh, I'm uh, part of the admission and financial aid team here at the University of North Carolina Asheville. We are incredibly excited to welcome you tonight. First and foremost, to congratulate you as admitted and for some of you committed students to the University of North Carolina Asheville. We are so excited about the um, prospect of you all joining us um, this fall um, as new students. I'm also incredibly excited that almost everybody on um, our call tonight um, listening in are new first year students. Um, so folks who are gonna be jumping into the college experience uh, for the first time um, and probably have a lot of questions about what you'll be able to do um, at a place like UNCA. So, we have some good information to share with you all tonight. Um, we've got a wonderful collection um, of folks from our campus community who represent um, the STEM fields um, and are excited to share with you all what we do as a part of this community and to start answering some of your questions about how you might imagine your academic journey here at UNCA. Um, I will let them introduce themselves um, more fully here in a moment, but we are joined tonight by doctors across the board, David Ramsey, um, who's coming to us um, from the engineering department, uh, Dr. David Gillette, um, who's from environmental science, uh, Dr. Kevin Stamp from um, computer science, Dr. David Wake from physics, um, Dr. Douglas Miller, professor of atmospheric sciences, um, and Dr. Amanda Wolf um, from our chemistry department. And then we are also very fortunate to also have Jacob um, Sonny. Um, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that you are uh, a sophomore student studying atmospheric sciences, but great to have a student here as well. Um, I will let all of you start by introducing yourselves a little bit more fully. I've asked our panelists this evening to, of course, give you a sense of where they're doing their work here on campus. Um, and to speak a little bit about some of their own um, research as well, just to give you a sense of who these folks are. Um, it is important to us that you think of these folks as partners in your academic journey. Um, and so understanding their background and interests will be very important as you get to know them um, as colleagues here on campus. So with that, I'm gonna go with my top left screen and ask uh, Dr. Ramsey, if you wanna go ahead and get us started with a brief introduction. Sure, uh, I'm David Ramsey. I've been here at UNCA for about three years and I'm the program director for the uh, engineering program. And it's, it's an odd program in that it's half administered by NC State and half by UNCA. So NC State provides the engineering content and UNCA provides liberal arts and say natural sciences content. Um, personally, I went from grad school off into industry. So I, I was in industry uh, research and development for 30 years and I've only been playing the academic game for a few years and I'm still trying to get the hang of it, but um, it's a, an interesting adventure trying to convey what I think are important topics to uh, different students. Glad to have you, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you for the introduction. Dr. Sanf, you're next on my screen. Hi, yeah, I'm Kevin Sanft. I'm in the Department of Computer Science. I've been at UNCA since 2015, and we're a small department, so I end up teaching, depending on the semester, everything from our intro course with no prerequisites through to our capstone course, which is a two-semester 
course where students work on their big senior project. Um, and then for my research, I have a few different projects usually involving students. Um, one is on sports analytics. It's kind of a fun one. And then another one is developing software and algorithms for sim stochastic biochemical kinetics. So basically simulating chemistry experiments on a computer. Very cool. And might get some questions about that one later. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wake, you're next on my screen. Hi, everybody. I'm David Wake from Physics and Astronomy. So I've been faculty here for about four years. Um, and I teach uh, astronomy. I haven't taught any physics so far. So I teach a lot of our introductory astronomy classes. Right now I'm teaching about stars and galaxies and cosmology. And I also teach some of our upper level classes. So in our department, we offer a physics major and then an astronomy minor and a physics minor. Um, so my research is focused on galaxies, what determines the properties of galaxies, particularly what controls how fast they form stars and how that's related to their location within the wider web of dark matter in the universe. Um, and the other thing I do is I run our campus observatory, um, both for teaching, but also we do a lot of public events up there or mainly, uh, well, we've started doing them again since COVID, but we stopped for a little while. Um, but we bring, yeah, lots of uh, members of the public to campus monthly and sometimes more regularly than that. And our students assist us with all of those things, as well as with my research. Awesome. Thank you. Dr. Wolf, next on my screen. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Amanda Wolf. I'm in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, and I've been here for nine years. Um, I came from, I went to undergrad at NC State University for chemistry and then went to grad school and then came here. Um, so in my department, I teach our lower level organic classes. So if you're a pre-med, um, that is a class that you need to take. And then I also teach our upper level courses related to my field, which is medicinal chemistry. Um, and so what my lab works on and is mostly my students in my lab, we work on antibiotic development. And so basically we make small molecule pharmaceutical agents that help combat bacteria. Awesome, Dr. Gillette. Thanks so much, good to see everyone here. So my name is David Gillette. I'm in the environmental studies department. I've been here since 2008. Um, and I teach courses uh, like several folks across the board from our intro to environmental studies course, which is what you might bring in credit for if for instance, you had an AP um, environmental science, uh, earth and environmental science course in high school, um, all the way up to um, our senior seminar courses and our and research as well. Um, my area of, of interest primarily is aquatic ecology. So studying how, how humans affect the way that river and stream ecosystems work. Um, and conversely, how those ecosystems affect how we're able to persist on the planet. Um, and uh, so I work with a couple students usually um, every year on different research projects locally. I've also done research on effects of climate change on fishes in Nepal. Um, so broadening that a few years ago. And so I've been taking that work back here to, to Western North Carolina and trying to collaborate with students here. So, um, so awesome that y'all could join us. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Gillette. Dr. Miller. Good evening. I'm Doug Miller from Atmospheric Science Department, and I've been at UNCA since 2004. And uh, I teach intro class and then uh, primarily junior and senior level classes, uh, the core courses, and then also some special topics courses. So uh, special topics courses, some of them are related to my research. Uh, I have students doing field research, uh, both the warm season and the cool season. Warm season, we're out there uh, supporting a rain gauge network up in the high elevations of the county next door to us. And in the winter season, we launch weather balloons during snowstorms. So we got a good opportunity to do that in January. And then uh, research that I work on with students on, on papers are related to how uh, the mountains impact the weather as it's cutting across the Southern Appalachians. So if that sounds interesting, I'd be glad to talk about that in more detail. I'll say everything you all have addressed already is interesting to me. So <laughs> glad I'm not the one who has to make a choice here. Uh, Jacob, uh, why don't I give you a chance to introduce yourself as well? We're so glad to have you here tonight. 
Of course. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm a sophomore level student at, here at UNC Asheville. I'm a major in atmospheric sciences with a concentration in climatology. Um, and my home, I, I'm coming from Pittsburgh, North Carolina. If any of you guys know where that is, uh, it's near the Chapel Hill area. So yeah, happy to be here. Well, thank you all um, as, as panelists for being here this evening and for sharing the knowledge um, that you all possess. Um, that is more than just what courses do you teach and what classes do we offer, but um, really being able to share so much more about the academic experiential um, opportunities here at UNCA. Um, students who are on the, the call with us tonight, I see some of you introducing yourselves in the chat, which is great. I'd also encourage you to use that Q&A function um, that is a little bit easier for us to manage um, because we can respond to some of your questions via um, the Q&A feature, others I might reserve for our panelists. I know a number of you offered some great questions um, as a part of your registration form. So we'll do our best to work through all of those. Um, you're also more than welcome to try to um, direct your question to one of these panelists if you'd like to learn a little bit more about their academic area. Um, but I've got some questions I'm gonna be throwing out um, to our panelists that anyone could respond to. Um, again, acknowledging that while we are representing different departments uh, here this evening, um, we are rep or these folks are representing the nat or, uh, natural sciences. Um, as an overall division um, of academics here at UNCA. So a good amount of collaboration happens between these folks anyway. Um, so again, um, feel free to use that Q&A feature, but I'm gonna get us started with um, kind of an overarching kind of question that I'm hoping a few of our um, panelists here could respond to. You know, one of the things that I think is, is really important about talking about UNCA is that we have incredibly strong STEM fields but at a campus that, in an, at an institution um, that doesn't necessarily get the recognition for that strength. And I mean that as a small institution um, that has historically been known as a liberal arts place, um, but liberal arts is more than just arts. Um, it's science, it's math, it's everything. But more importantly, what a small public institution is meant to do is to create really engaged and meaningful interactions between students and faculty, um, where you have so much more opportunity to have direct experiential learning um, in your day to day and across your program over the course of, you know, two, three or four years, depending on um, kind of your entry point and, and how you graduate. So the general question I wanted to throw out to our panelists is, what is the benefit of studying a STEM field at a small intentional institution like UNCA? Any volunteers that want to kick us off? Dr. Wolf, I'm seeing your hand, go for it. I don't know if we're using the raise hand function, but I will. I love it. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think that that's one of the actually most, like the greatest things about UNC Asheville compared to like some of your bigger schools that have large graduate programs is that it is our undergraduate students that are doing all of the research with us as faculty directly, um, rather than working with like a graduate student or somebody like l underneath the faculty. And so, for example, like my students, they typically spend for BS or for a BS chemistry major, you're required to do two years of undergraduate research. Um, but even if you're a BA, you're still encouraged um, to do undergraduate research. And so those students end up being able to really get deep into a research project enough so that they can go and present. Like I'm taking uh, for students to San Diego to a national conference in a week so that they can present their research. And that's all their work, you know, with support from me, of course, but like, it's what they've actually done and they're going to present on it. And so I think that that's something that's pretty impactful. Anyone else want to offer comments? Dr. Gillette, thank you. Thanks. I'll, I'll use the, the raise hand function as well. Yeah, totally agree with what Dr. Wolf said. I think to me that that's the biggest thing. I know uh, I went to a, a small, smaller liberal arts college myself and studied the sciences. And, and what I love is just, you know, the strength of relationships that, that you form. I mean, even my intro to environmental science class, like I know them all by their first name. Um, I know what their interests are. We talk after class if they have questions about this or that topic. And so there's just a real opportunity um, to build relationships in all sorts of ways. Uh, and that helps, I think, to, um, to learn what, what your opportunities are. And then as Dr. Wolf said, being able to engage with, with research, you know, with, with professors where, again, without a graduate program, like we really, we're here because we love to work with undergraduate students and, you know, it's, it's so exciting for us. Um, so yeah, I just think that that close relationship, um, I think everybody benefits from. And I think that's just so, so valuable because you know, as a science student, 
you're learning laboratory techniques, field techniques, you're learning analytical techniques on the computer. And it's just such a benefit to be, you know, at the same desk as a faculty member and working through things together. I just think there's a lot of great collaborative learning that happens. Dr. Sanf. Yeah, so I went to a small liberal arts college when I was in college and we've all been talking about research. I didn't know what research was at that time, but I, because it's a small college, you get to know your faculty. I had a professor who said, oh, you should work on some research with me. And I was like, okay, I didn't really, it's like, okay, sounds like a fine idea. And, you know, I had no, at that time, no intention of going off uh, to graduate school. It ended up being great for grad school, but um, it ended up being great too for uh, job interviews. Like I, I went to industry after, after college and I found that at all these interviews, all my, all my answers to their questions were coming from this research experience because it's just, I don't know, richer and deeper than, than, than what you get in, in the classroom. It just goes be above and beyond what you normally see. And so I encourage everyone to do that, but I would also encourage you all to not be like me and be sort of passive and wait for a professor to come talk to you. Go talk to your faculty. So that'd be my advice. Like, take the initiative. We're at a small place. You can take advantage of it. You know, when I first came to UNC, one of the, the first facts I learned about this place that, that just floored me was that about 70% of our undergraduate students do some sort of independent research before they graduate. Um, and I think the comments that have been offered thus far are incredibly important to acknowledge that that only happens because of people like our faculty on this call tonight. Um, the fact that you have those close relationships, as I mentioned, you are treated like a colleague um, in, <laughs> in that academic space where you're encouraged to, to you know, partner as opposed to having this authoritative kind of teacher student, you know, arbiter of knowledge and, and passing it along. Um, you know, this is something that, that you will find is a meaningful experience that can enable you to do things that you didn't think that you might do in your college experience. So I love that we've started with research or experiential learning where you can have hands-on context-based learning in these fields. But I think one of the questions that was posed um, by one of our students who registered ahead of time that I want to throw out here because I thought it was incredibly compelling, especially considering um, who we've got here on the call tonight, the question that was asked um, is essentially, how did you know that you wanted to teach rather than working in the field? And I love that question because even by your introduction tonight, that's not a totally accurate statement for all of you. Um, so I'm hoping some of you could talk about the value of, of being an educator, but with your experience in the field and how the two are actually incredibly important to developing a whole sense, especially as an academician. So anybody wanna talk about industry work as in addition to academic work. Go ahead, Dr. Ramsey. Okay, since I, I offered the fact that I worked in industry. Um, <laughs> You're not the only one. <laughs> um, so, you know, I was in grad school a ridiculously long time. And so I, I was very used to the university environment and I, I was comfortable in that. But I really wanted to practice what I had learned. And so I, I wanted to escape, you know, at some point. And I wanted to go out and be a real life practicing engineer. And I did that for, for 30 enjoyable years. And then I decided, okay, I understand what that is. I'm done with that. Let me try something different. And, and so it's fun coming back to the university environment that I kind of grew up with and trying to pick from my practical engineering experience, what did they teach me that I think is really important and that I should pass on to others? And what was just superfluous nonsense that, yeah, they didn't have to teach me in the first place. So I, I think it's, it gives me a balanced view of what I could try to convey to students in a class that here's what you need to be, doing in the practical engineering world, but here's what you need to, to be thinking about as an engineering student. And it, it's an interesting challenge to try to uh, make a coherent story out of all that. Dr. Wright, thank you. So I, I haven't worked in industry, but uh, being an astronomer, um, but 
I do practice. I mean, as we've already all already mentioned, right? So we're not just teaching, we're doing as well. So I spend some of my time still doing astrophysics research. And I did a lot of that before I came to UNCA. Um, and I think for me, and probably for most of us, we became teachers because we love to explain the things that we have learned and continue to try and figure out um, about the mysteries of how the world works, because that's what we will work on to other people and seeing their excitement and enthusiasm and that moment of, of understanding and of learning. And there is nothing more exciting and affirming to do that as a teacher, right? Um, and equally, as, as David was just talking, we're looking to share what we've managed to learn over the years in order to continue to build up the next generation of people that will take the ideas that we're trying to, to figure out and take them on and maybe solve some of them, right? So we spend a lot of time working on, on these different ideas and we're not gonna answer all the questions, right? So we're all keen to spread that knowledge on. Um, so I think we're all enthusiastic both about the teaching and the practice, right? And they're equally rewarding and in very different ways, right? The teaching reward is very immediate. Whereas the, the practice, the research reward can take a long time to get any sort of answer at all, but then those moments are amazing. Right? So I think we enjoy them both. Any other thoughts or comments on that one? I love those responses because I think that's the most important thing to understand about these folks in front of you is that they're people who are doing and telling about what they're doing. Um, and that is something that is incredibly compelling about being a faculty member because you've got folks here who actually understand what it's like to have to discover the depth of your interest in a certain area. And you know that that is not necessarily a linear process. You don't just come in as a first year student, start exploring, define what you want to do and focus on that only. So the next question I have for our faculty here and, and even for you know Jacob potentially, um, who is kind of in that point in his academic career where you've probably got some sense of what you're doing, but maybe you're still figuring things out. You know, declaring a major in a field as broad as something like biology or chemistry um, doesn't necessarily inspire a career path or an academic focus um, more specifically. So I'm hoping each of you might be able to talk a little bit more about how you advise students towards declaring a major, but then more importantly, we've got a question specifically about how do students specify within a certain field and how does that work over their time at a place like UNCA where you're going to have deeper and deeper focus, not just in terms of your academic work, but also with your relationships with faculty. So declaring a major and also trying to declare some specificity within that program. Anybody want to touch on that? Jacob, I love it. Jumping right in. All right. So I will say that declaring a major, I mean, it's, I mean, you're, everybody's interests are going to be different. But um, just starting, like I started in atmospheric scientists in at mix, atmospheric sciences, sorry, it's a mouthful. Um, and then I just kind of went with it. It is okay to change or change your major at pretty much any time if you find that your interest is waning or you want to go into something else. But just kind of like I just kind of committed directly to something and I've been enjoying it. But um yeah, it, it, it also might take some time. You don't have to declare your major immediately. Um, just find something you're interested in and then just kind of stick with your gut, I guess, would be my advice. Wolf. Yeah, I was going to say um, kind of what Jacob said is that the, the thing that I think is really great about UNC Asheville is that you actually don't declare have to declare a major coming in. Um, which is different than other like UNC system schools or other schools. Um, and so you have like an intent to declare, which will help you kind of get what classes to take. But the way that all majors are set up is that you don't have to know exactly what you want to do from the minute you step on campus. Um, the courses are flexible enough that you'll still be able to get your degree within four years, even if you take time to kind of search around and figure out what you want to do. Um, in terms of like specialization, I saw one question in the Q and A about, do you have to go to graduate school? You absolutely do not. And I think um, the specialization kind of happens as you get into your degree and you find out what you're most interested within within that field. And typically that's because of some courses that you take. 
right? It could be like an upper level course that's a little bit more specialized or something like that. And that's kind of how you find your way. And I will say one thing is that, you know, we have a lot of students that go directly into industry um, as well as go into graduate school from, from chemistry and biochemistry. And even if it's not in the field that they did research in, what they're, what the companies are really looking for is that you're able to think as a scientist and like reason things out, approach research in a particular way. And so you really have a lot of diversity in your field choice, even post-graduation. Yeah, Dr. Miller, thank you. Yeah, so a long piggyback off of uh, what Dr. Wolf just said, I would say, you know, don't be afraid to experiment, you know, try a research project and research project may be something that really gets you excited or it may be something that says, no, I don't think I wanna do that. You know, open up opportunities beyond just what you're doing in the classroom. Uh, internships are another thing that are encouraged at UNCA. And so taking every advantage of trying things while you're, you know, even in your first year, that will really help to sharpen your focus on what you see as your interests and what in the same way, maybe your interests are not. And so, you know, there are opportunities for mentor programs, there are opportunities for K-12 outreach, uh, assuming everything's, you know, gonna be opening up fully, hopefully. Uh, so, you know, any kind of learning opportunity beyond just what the classes are that you're taking, uh, I think really also helps define what you ultimately wanna do in terms of both your major and then your concentration within the major. One thing I'll note as well is I had you all start by introducing yourself, what you teach, but also what you focus on as well. Um, students, a reminder that you've probably heard this from your admission counselor at some point in this process, but now that you are not just somebody who might be interested in UNCA, but has the opportunity to, to be here, I highly encourage you to get back on our website and look at all of our academic departments, right? The fact that our faculty um, choose to be at a place like this to teach is because they also want you to leverage their experience and their perspective. So um, you will find that as you get into your major, as you start to focus on choosing an advisor within that program and start to focus on specific coursework in the areas that interest you, you're gonna develop relationships with certain folks on campus because they're studying those things as well. Um, I highly encourage you to check out our faculty and student profiles on our departmental websites. Um, so you have a sense of who you might wanna connect with, um, right? These folks are representing their departments, um, but they've got a number of colleagues who are excited and willing to chat with you as well. If there you've got work that is interesting to you. Um, so now is your time to start connecting uh, because questions about how to declare major you have until the end of your sophomore year to keep asking those questions, but you can be asking as soon as now, um, as you have things that are on your mind about what you might want to study and where you might want to head. Any other thoughts or comments on that question before I move us along? All right. So there was a question in there about graduate school, um, but generally speaking, I just wanted to ask, what are the kind of end of, of academics experience or academic program goals in your departments, right? What are you working on developing students to be ready for at the end of their UNC education? And I'm talking about learning outcomes, professional goals in terms of um, careers or different fields. Some of your students might choose to continue in academics. What is the end result of studying a STEM field um, at UNCA from your various perspectives? Dr. Gillette, saw your hand first, go ahead. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe building off just a little bit of what Dr. Miller said. Um, you know, one thing with our students in environmental science is that um, we, we try to have conversations fairly early on with our, with our advisees about their interests. You know, I mean, like a lot of, of the faculty here, I'm sure, you know, my first conversation with my advisees, like, you know, what, what really gets you excited? You know, what, what, what do you, I mean, do you have a job in mind that, that you would really love to do, right? And, and if so, then let's let's chart a path to get there, right? And um, this I'm sure varies among fields, but in the environmental field, the cool thing about being here in Asheville is there's a pretty good chance that if there's an environmental job you're interested in, there's probably someone doing it here in Asheville. I mean, with you know, with with a few exceptions, I'm sure. Uh, and so then getting connected with a community, right? Starting to build those professional networks as well as 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 being in, in your classes. And so so. Um, so getting out there and volunteering, like if someone is really interested in the nonprofit sector, right? Volunteering with 
some of the amazing nonprofits in our area is a great way to get experience, figure out if it's for you or not, and also start building that professional network. Um, if, you know, most of our courses have research experiences kind of embedded in them, and if a student really enjoys that, uh, and they're thinking about, yeah, you know, I think I really might like to be a scientist. Well, that's amazing. Who are you going to do undergraduate research with? So I think that question is really um, sort of embedded in the advising process, right? Which, of course, everyone here is advised by faculty, as you all probably know. And in our major, um, students have the option either to, to do undergraduate research or internship. And so if a student really wants to get right into the workforce right after um, undergrad, uh, internship is kind of the way that we go, whereas others, um, you know, if they're really excited about grad school, definitely want that research experience. So someone can write you a letter of recommendation that's seen you doing research. So, um, so yeah, it's just an individual conversation, I think, with, with each advisee, and you can do that at a small school like here, um, and then just really setting a, set a course to try to get the students somewhere they want to get to. Dr. Wright, thank you. So I can say a little bit about, you know, where you might go next after a physics degree and, and STEM generally. So in most of these fields, this is true and certainly in physics, you're obviously learning the fundamentals of the subject. And so that can then be applied within the areas that that applies, but you're also learning a lot more than that. You're learning sort of problem solving skills, mathematical problem solving skills, particularly. You're learning to do data analysis. You're learning computing skills often. You're learning uh, to work in a laboratory environment. You're learning um, to explain complex ideas to other people. So not just to understand them, but to explain them clearly and simply. And these are all enormously transferable skills to, to huge range of fields. So. You know, physics, you could be doing anything from climate science, space work, to data science, so artificial intelligence, you could be going into finance, you could be working in the gaming industry, uh, sorry, computer gaming industry, um, not gambling. So there's many, there's many ways you could be doing that too. That's all data analysis, right? So there are many areas. So although we all went to graduate school and there's always a, a danger when you're talking to academics, that that's the way they think you should go because we all did it, um, about, only, about, uh, only about a third of physics majors go to graduate school. The rest go off into industry or into education straight away. And of those, only well, fewer than half end up becoming professors, right? So there's a huge range you can do. And even if you're, and people have asked about graduate school, even if you're keen to stay within the field, we've had several students in recent years in astronomy that haven't gone to graduate school, but have gone to work at observatories or labs straight with their physics major. So there's a vast um, range of things you can do with these STEM degrees, even when they're such blue skies research as physics or astrophysics, right? That seem very inapplicable. You're learning things that are useful almost everywhere and generally very well paid too, incidentally. Go ahead, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you. Um, I guess in our uh, engineering department, it would simplify my life a lot in thinking about curriculum if I knew what a student was going to, to do after leaving school. And, and I never know that. So I don't know, are we training them to be uh, an engineer supporting a, a factory operation? Are they going to be programming robots in Detroit? Are they going to go to graduate school? I have no clue. So we try to fill their toolbox with the insights to be able to, to accomplish any of those things. Um, so we get the, we, we end up offering a fairly broad curriculum um, and the specifics of half those courses, they will probably never revisit again. But, but all those courses are making them think like engineers, making them learn how to solve problems and how to be logical thinking uh, uh, folks where, wherever they end up. Um, as, as I think David said, yeah, I'll guess a, a third of our students do end up heading to grad school, but two thirds aren't. 
and and we try to give them the tool sets that they can go out and and get a job doing whatever they like immediately after graduation. Thank you for those comments. And I think that is ultimately underscoring one of the reasons that students would choose a place like UNCA where um, we think broadly and deeply about what we will do to educate you and the skills that you will learn um, are gonna be transferable to a variety of different career paths and industries after you leave. And so we really do focus on developing well-rounded students. Um, I also wanna acknowledge that a number of you who have registered tonight um, don't have just one um, academic focus in a STEM field. Uh, many of you listed secondary or tertiary academic interests in your application that will pull you in different directions. So there's also the reality that what you will do with your degree and your um, education after you graduate may be a mix of something that you've studied in the STEM fields as well as things you may have studied with arts and humanities or in social sciences. Um, so what you want to accomplish with that degree after you leave or after you um, complete and leave um, is going to be up to you. Um, so these folks are here to help guide you, um, but they're more likely to ask you more questions than you ask them. Um, so be prepared to talk about what interests you and where you might want to go. Um, I am going to change focus a little bit. We've got some um, specific questions about some specific programs, um, so I'm going to offer those up uh, rapid fire. Dr. Ramsey, I'm going to be coming to you first. Um, we've got some folks who are asking for a little bit of clarification about our engineering programs. Um, I'll start by acknowledging that we offer two primary focuses or foci here at um, UNCA. Um, we do have a unique mechatronics engineering program, which is a joint degree with NC State or North Carolina State, but it is a four-year program here on campus at UNCA. We do also have a two plus two engineering program with NC State in which students would complete their first two years here at UNCA um, and then transfer to North Carolina State um, to complete that program. Um, Dr. Ramsey, if you wanna just touch on some of the unique aspects of those two programs and ultimately um, if there's any nuance to the process, for example, I know our two plus two is a very quick focus. If it's something that students are looking to do, um, they need to identify themselves pretty quickly. Um, but anything that you could offer to kind of distinguish those two programs? Sure. Um, you know, if we go back 40 years or so, I, I think that's about when they instituted an engineering department here at, at UNCA. And the idea was the state decided they wanted to be able to train students in engineering in the Western North Carolina area. So there was nothing else available. And you know, that would be, all right, support local industry, train people for those jobs and, and, and so on and so forth. So originally it was all two plus two program. You would do first two years here, and then you would go to Raleigh at NC State and finish up in the area of specialization you, you had. And I think there are, I wanna say 11 different engineering departments at NC State. You could go from civil engineering to mechanical, to electrical, to you know who knows what. But the, there are a lot of very specific programs. And we still offer that two plus two approach. It has morphed into some are two plus two, some are one plus threes. Depending on what course load you're actually gonna to have to face in that very specific engineering discipline, they may want you to only do a year here and then start taking the, the uh, discipline specific courses at NC State. Honestly, out of, out of the students who come into the engineering program, maybe only, 15, 20% end up pursuing two plus two uh, today. The others stay for our four year or maybe five year, I hate to say, um, joint degree pro program between UNCA and NC State in mechatronics. And mechatronics is very unique in that it's trying to combine the disciplines of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering and a, a, a somewhat lesser amount of computer science. And the um, archetype for um, a mechatronics gadget might be a robot. A robot needs all those things to function. 
So we've tried to put together a curriculum that provides you with the background to do that. And we think it has an important place in uh, the STEM job marketplace. And we're, we're one of only four ABET accredited mechatronics programs in the country. So it's a very unique program and UNCA provides the liberal arts component. They provide the math and physics and chemistry component and NC State provides the um, purely engineering course component uh, for that degree program. Thank you, Dr. Ramsey. And I think that's an important distinction for those who are thinking about engineering, but I will also share that for those who are specifically looking for that two plus two, as I mentioned, it is a very quick onboarding. Um, we've got to get students registered for the right types of courses right in their first semester. So I am going to be dropping into the chat um, the name and com or email for Linnea Linton. Um, she's one of our campus colleagues who advises incoming students about getting jump started on that program. Um, so if you are definitely interested in either of the engineering programs, but especially the two plus two, um, we do highly encourage um, you to reach out um, to Linnea. She is eager <laughs> to talk with you all. Um, and she's got a list of admitted and committed students. So um, she will easily be able to find you and get you um, connected with some of those um, planning resources. So again, I'll drop that into the chat right here. Um, I'm going to turn it um, over to Dr. Wolf. i um, got a question for you. i um, got a student who is interested in pre-health professions. And I want to first acknowledge that um, some of you may be a little bit concerned or confused about the fact that you see a lot of departments and majors listed on our website, but maybe you have a career path that you want to pursue and aren't necessarily sure about how you will do that at a place like UNCA. So I'm going to first acknowledge that we have a few pre-professional programs. So those are going to be programs that allow students to focus on career um, and professional development, by focusing on um, their academic work in certain areas. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're graduating with a degree in nursing, for example, um, but it is going to be a program or a track of courses that allow you to be prepared to go into that profession. So Dr. Wolf, could you talk a little bit about our pre-health program um, and generally about how students can leverage pre-professional programs um, while focusing in an academic area in the STEM? Yeah, so we have a ton of students who go into a health-related field post-graduation, um, especially from the biology department and from the chemistry department. Um, and so we have a lot of support for our pre-health students. And so this is including like PAs, pharmacy, MD, DOs, nursing, all like all of it, veterinary school. Um, and so what we have in, even though we don't have like a, yeah, like a pre-health degree, what we do is we have a committee of faculty, the pre-health faculty committee that um, basically advises students from the time you start here to help you kind of know what classes you're going to need to take to be able to take your MCAT or whatever um, as you progress through. And then also helps when you're actually going out to get internships, to get shadowing or anything like that. Um, we have a a program with Mayhack to help students do that in the summer, which is a local hospital system around here. Um, and then we also write the committee letters for you to go and apply to these um, health graduate programs. And so the I think the thing that's helpful about having you all get a, a degree in some field, and it doesn't have to be a STEM field, you can go and be a doctor and have an English degree, like that's totally fine. Um, but it's just having a completed degree one, it makes you a better candidate for all of these schools. There's a lot of pharmacy schools that say that you just need the courses, you don't need the degree, but it, it's going to make you a better candidate to have the degree, um, not only just to have it on your resume, but, but all the things that come with the degree. Um, and so that's one thing that we really encourage is we're going to help you navigate what you need for the to go into anything that's health related, but getting the degree is also important um, to make you a well-rounded person in that field. And we also have a lot of student groups related to that as well. So if you are interested in it, it's not just faculty run, we have a pre-health profession student group that's very active and does a lot of stuff. Awesome. And thank you to our panelists for continuing to respond to some of those questions, uh, both in the chat and the Q&A. So if you dropped one in there, you may see a response. Um, 
a little bit of clarification um, for folks uh, on the engineering. Um, so the the dual, uh, sorry, the joint degree program, Dr. Ramsey, those um, courses that are offered technically through NC State, but for the um, joint program where the students would do mechatronics for um, all four years here at UNCA, those courses that are taught technically through NC State, are those virtual or are they in-person? Uh, it, it's a mix. Um, okay. If, if I can, by credit hours, I'll say about half the engineering courses, you're going to receive live lectures on a video link from Raleigh, um, which gives us the opportunity to tap into a, a, a rather larger group of faculty to provide the, the individual expertise in, in a number of areas. But we want to do a lot of hands-on work in laboratory courses and such. And some courses we find work better with a live, live instructor rather than a, a video instructor. So we'll, we'll intentionally teach those locally. So 50-50 mix on a, a credit hour basis, but that, that allows us to give you the breadth of tapping into NC State faculty without quite the expense of having that many faculty here locally. Thank you for that. I know you had responded in the chat. Just wanted to make sure that that yeah, was uh, addressed um, for everybody as well. Dr. Sant, i um, got a question from a student who's saying, you know, hey, interested in engineering, also liking some computer science. So, you know, knowing that engineering has a little bit more structure from the start. If a student kind of went that direction, but chose to peel off and stay at UNCA for all four years and, and switch over to computer science, how well does that work? Um, and I might even just generally ask that to all of you changing majors or changing fields within STEM. Um, good flexibility, good opportunity. You know, what does that look like? But Dr. Stamp, I'll go to you first. Yeah, in computer science, we get that a lot. We, we get a lot of engineering students who end up minoring in computer science. Um, several of the engineering courses get credit toward a computer science minor. Um, and then, yeah, we do get people who switch over, decide for whatever reason that they like com computer science more. Um, I don't know if it goes as much the other way, just because like you said, the engineering programs tend to be pretty structured and usually the people you know, come in intending to do that. Um, but, but yeah, I would say that's a, that's a pretty common thing. So, you know, switching majors into computer science, out of computer science and sort of all over the university. Thank you. Any other comments about kind of cross-listed courses, accomplishing multiple programs, major, minor, or just Switching programs as students figure out what they're interested in. Dr. Ramsey, go ahead. No, and I think that's pretty typical, at least for engineering students. You know, they're going to get exposed to a handful of engineering courses and physics courses and computer science courses. And, and they're going to realize, oh, I like that one better. And, and so they'll bail on engineering and they'll go over to computer science and you know, fact of life, and that's wonderful. They, they found something that they're really drawn to, or they'll say, yeah, I'm, I'm this applied stuff, not so much for me, give me pure physics, that's okay. Uh, this is all a discovery process for all of us in terms of, of what, what really excites us. And so we fully uh, anticipate and support uh, these changes in direction. So kind of leverage this question as I see a few others. Um, so Dr. Wolf, a student had asked, what's the difference between chemistry, biology, and biochemistry, <laughs> right? So again, kind of alluding to the fact that we do already have some overlap. Uh, Dr. Gillette, I'm also gonna come back to you um, with a similar type question. I'm kind of seeing like, you know, what folks might minor in to kind of leverage um, environmental science in, in a few different ways. So again, talking about kind of cross-listed and, and multi-focused multi um, academic paths. Dr. Wolf, what do you got for us first? Yeah, so I know that we don't have anybody from biology here tonight, so I can just, I'll briefly talk about their program. So the biology department is broadly split into two different areas, and one overlaps more with chemistry and one overlaps more with environmental sciences. And so they have their cell and molecular biology side, um, which is the more chemistry side. And then they have their environmental sciences side, which is the more environmental science or sorry, the eco evolution side, which is the more environmental sciences side. And it's all, I, I mean, the reason they all have similar names and they all overlap is because 
the different fields just look at the same problems from a different perspective, right? So as a chemist, we're looking at biological problems at, on like the atomic, right? And molecular level, the really small scale level and trying to figure out how this works. Whereas the biologists on cell and molecular biology are looking at like the cellular level, right? And then they get bigger and bigger from there. And so there is a ton of overlap within majors. Um, it's just, you know, you kind of find the major that fits best with your interest and most with your interest, because right. As a, if you were like a biology major, you would take both the eco evolution side and the cell and molecular side and get both of those. Um, as a chemistry major, you take the more biochemistry stuff as well as the more physics. And like, we have actually a course called physical chemistry. That's a physics based or a chemistry physics based chemistry course. I don't know the physics and the chemistry are flip flopped around in there somewhere. And so, yeah, you kind of pick on what perspective you kind of like to look at things, but really they do overlap a lot. And that's why actually within majors, you'll see students who are double majors, minors, like it's all over the map in terms of mis mix mixing and matching. Dr. Gillette, wanna add in? Sure, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, our department in environmental studies is pretty interdisciplinary. I mean, some of our faculty have PhD degrees in biology, some in geology, others in uh, in management. And so, um, I, I just put an answer in the um, in the in the the Q and A there. But um, you know, so we have three different concentrations in our department: um, management and policy, uh, earth science, and then ecology and environmental biology. And um, so we pair quite well with the biology department. In fact, we have several courses that are cross-listed. So um, when students in our ecology and environmental biology concentration are filling out their upper level hours, they can do a certain number of those hours from the biology department. If I dare say it, we have a mutualistic relationship. <laughs> um, and so there's a lot of, of kind of back and forth with students there. Um, and uh, the earth science concentration connects pretty well with, with the chemistry department. There's you know, we have a course in water chemistry. Um, there are a few uh, double majors that I'm aware of from there. Our management policy um, concentration actually has the most flexibility in it. And because of that, they, they connect um, quite a bit with the economics department. We actually have some amazing environmental economists on campus. Um, and so um, they'll hopefully be able to take some of their courses, um, but then also sociology um, and uh, um, poli sci a little bit. Um, so, so yeah, I guess just as far as connection goes, um, as Dr. Wolf was saying, you know, you might ask what's the difference between a biology degree and an environmental studies degree with a concentration in ecology and environmental biology, right? And really, the, the difference would be like in, in environmental studies, um, like we're really studying the biology just in the context of, 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 of human activity, right? So, so we're really sort of discreetly studying how the humans and the environment interact, whereas in biology in its purest form, where like I did my master's and PhD degree, um, you might not really be looking at the humans. It might just be how does this ecosystem work kind of without homo sapiens in the picture. Um, but I mean, the wonderful thing about UNCA is you've got those two years to kind of sample across the curriculum and really get to know some of the awesome faculty and students. And, and as Dr. Wolf mentioned, there's some great student groups too. We haven't talked too much about that, but that's a great way to connect with like-minded folks, make make friends, build those important relationships and explore different ideas and areas. So. Thank you both. I am gonna start wrapping us up. Um, I know there's some questions that I think our panelists might be responding to um, in the chat or the Q and A, but as a kind of closing thought, um, that way I can uh, kind of go around the virtual table here and ask for a response from everybody. Question uh, that I think Dr. Miller said from the start, he's excited to answer. What is your favorite thing about UNCA? But if you don't love that question, let me also just ask, what is something that you think is unique, cool, or interesting about your department or the work that you have done um, that you would love to share with our students here tonight? So Dr. Miller, if you're ready, I'm gonna go to you first on this one. Yes, sir. So first of all, uh, teaching is what we love at UNCA. And I really like that UNCA doesn't mean just teaching in the classroom. So uh, teaching out in the field, teaching uh, in a field trip, you know, and there's all sorts of ways that teaching can happen. And, and I really like that flexibility. And the fact that it's a, a small school, uh, you're gonna know all the students, you're gonna know your professors, 
And so it really is kind of a family atmosphere. And so what I really like is that, you know, it's a very supportive environment, very personable. And, you know, if you want to be anonymous, UNCA is not the place you want to go. So those are the kinds of things that I really appreciate about UNC Asheville. Perfect start, thank you. Who wants to go next? Go with whoever on mutes first. I can go. Thanks, Dr. Wake. So this is gonna sound kind of trite, but my answer to when people ask me what I like about UNCA is always the same and it's the students. And so I've actually worked at a lot of universities in my 20 years since my PhD. And I find our students to be incredibly open, incredibly kind and caring of each other and, and thus, and also as a result, incredibly easy to work with as people. And it's a fantastic community to be a part of. And our faculty similarly, of course, they're all wonderful people, but the students really are what make UNCA a great place. In terms of something exciting, so if you are interested in space, and I know a few people are. So both myself and Professor Lundgren, who's the other astronomer, we both work with data from the Hubble Space Telescope. And right now we're involved in the largest program that is currently happening with the Hubble Space Telescope. So there are, and we have several of our students working with that data. So if you're interested in space, you can be working on the most cutting edge space projects, studying galaxies. If you want to do planets, you're a little bit out of luck, but if you like galaxies or you're interested in using the best data, then you have that chance with us. Okay. You want to feel incredibly small in the amazing world. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Who'd like to go next? All right. I'm happy, I'm happy to I'm happy to talk. Just in, in computer science, I just I'm really proud to be in our department. I just think we do a really good job of preparing students to do whatever they want to do. So that, you know, we talked about grad school a little bit. In computer science, we probably only get, I want to say 10% or so that go off to grad school, but uh, that's not where most of them want to go. They want to go and get great jobs, and they do, and um, they end up, uh, they, they do really well. So I'm really proud of what, what we offer and what our students are able to accomplish. So I think that's what I'd say. Thank you. Dr. Ramsey, I'll go to you next. Oh. Jacob, how about we end with you? Could that student experience last? Okay, um, I guess what I find interesting, I mean, I've been fascinated by this combination, if you will, of mechanical, electrical, and software engineering since I was in grade school. I find any of those individual disciplines to be a little on the boring side. I'm fascinated by, by what happens when you put them all together. And, and so I'm, I'm really enjoying the opportunity to see that in a degree program, where that's the intention, to, to put those together in one of these few programs in the country and, and try to see what kind of successful students we can produce uh, with that combination of backgrounds. Thank you, Dr. Gillette. The first thing to say about UNCA that I'm so proud of is, uh, I mean, it's an amazingly inexpensive small college liberal arts education. I mean, you can pay three, four times the amount to go to a, a, a private, you know, an um, undergraduate liberal arts school and like arts and science school. <laughs> and it's it's just so awesome to have freshmen and, you know, uh, their, their first college class and like it's discussion based and you're hearing what everyone has to say. And and I just echo what Dr. Wake said, like our students are amazing. And uh, one of the reasons I love our introduction, our introductory classes, because we have students from all different majors and students that don't know their majors. And we have some great conversations, you know, some respectful conversations about things, things like climate change, things like, you know, how, how the world is going, right? Like college is an amazing place for us to exchange ideas and, um, and develop our own ideas based, based in facts, right? With those skills, like, Dr. Week mentioned those critical thinking skills that we really get to, to sort out how our world works. So it's just an amazing, amazing place that, a, in my opinion, an incredible um, bargain. And um, yeah, just a great, I look, look forward to getting to getting to class every day. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Gillette. And uh, Jacob, what have we missed? What do these students need to know as a current student yourself? Um, 
Well, I say one of my favorite things is just like since Asheville is like located in the mountains, uh, like for example, right outside of my dorm, like right out the window is a gorgeous view of the mountains. And there aren't a lot of, I mean, I'm sure there are other places you could get that, but I mean, Asheville it is just like gorgeous. Um, as well as the student body itself, is there, uh, there's just a lot of really nice people just in general. Um, I've also made a lot of friends. There's a lot of uh, club opportunities like the AMS, which is the American Meteorological Society. I uh, met a lot of friends through that. Um, as well as there, I think there's an esports club if you're interested in that. Um, and there's also just a lot of undergrad research opportunities, uh, a lot of opportunities to connect with your professor and fellow students. It's just, I don't know, I like it a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. And I know it's it's easy to lean in when everybody else has talked about our community, but I do think that is one of the things that makes this place special is that we are small intentionally and the people who join our community do so intentionally as well. And so that high degree of purpose um, you will find here on campus in so many ways. So we're excited to only start to introduce you to all the opportunities that we have here at UNCA. Many thanks to our, our faculty and student here tonight for sharing their perspectives. Um, do know that, again, they represent a number of faculty and students in all these departments. Um, and you are more than welcome to reach out to anybody that you can find on our website who you think might be a good connection. You're admitted, or some of you are committed. We want to have you as a part of our community and want to answer any questions that you have um, that will make you able to choose us um, for your college experience. Do know that we have more sessions that are coming. These Q&As with UNCA are offered um, twice a week, generally Tuesdays and Thursdays, a variety of different sessions coming up. So please continue to register and sign up for those. We'll send you some updates as well. Finally, I want to acknowledge that we are coming up um, on our first of two admitted student days. Um, the first one will be coming up on Saturday, March 19th. Our second one um, on Saturday, April 9th. Um, those registration links are going to be right on um, the admitted student page on our website. So do please um, consider coming to campus and joining us. Um, we'll be so excited to welcome you. Um, but any other questions that you have um, as you make your final college choice, um, please reach out to us at admissions at unca.edu and we will be happy to get you connected with folks on campus. So congrats again to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I will applaud our panelists for all of you who can't do so on camera. Um, thank you all. Have a great evening and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>